So a characteristic feature of the bifurcation is that it has a, there's a zero eigenvalue, which means that there is some direction in the phase plane or phase space that's associated with a very slow time scale. And that implies that there is some time scale separation and we should be able to use uh, multiple time scales as an approach to solve the equations. So that's what we're going to do now. We're going to rederive the equations that we got from the Zeno manifold reduction, essentially the same equation, uh, using multiple time scales. So let's do that explicitly first at, in our example. So we have our example is x dot is equal to mu x plus xy minus gamma x cubed and y dot is equal to minus y plus x squared minus y squared. And at the bifurcation point, mu is zero and we have a slow time scale. And so let's introduce a slow time scale, a slow time t um, with some power of epsilon. Um, so the question is, of course, how to choose that? That's one of the, the everlasting questions, so to speak, in this kind of problem. So let me assume we get by with some power epsilon to the alpha. I mean, from perturbation methods, you know that there could be logarithmic scales and all kind of stuff like that. It turns out for bifurcations, usually you have just some powers. Could be fractional powers, but powers. Okay, good. And so, but how do I find out what alpha should be? And also I need to expand the amplitudes in epsilon two, and I need to expand my um, control parameter in epsilon. So this is often sort of, in perturbation methods, often that's kind of like a guessing game, which is not much fun. Um, now, in these bivocations, you can get a lot of information from the expected result. So there are some ways, which we'll talk about later, but they can look at the equations and expect a certain type of bifurcation. I mean, in our case, you know, what you have is we have a satellite bifurcation, transcritical bifurcation, or a pitchfork, and you can sort of make guesses as to what the kind of equation it should be, what it will be. And um, now in this case, we have done the calculation already, right? So from the center manifold reduction, we know that we expect, let's say, that the equation looks like this. It's a mu x minus gamma minus one x cubed, meaning it's a pitchfork bifurcation. So, if this multiple scale analysis is supposed to lead to an equivalent result, then we can read off what we sh how we should scale things. So let me maybe start with saying, I'm gonna expand X and Y uh, with epsilon to the one power. That I can pick arbitrarily. The first is arbitrary and then later, uh, the other ones have to follow suit. Okay, so we have this, we, let's assume we can do that. If that's the case, then we see that we have here a term x cubed, which would amount to actually being an epsilon cubed term. So we expect that this whole equation is actually epsilon cubed. So therefore, we read off that mu should actually be of order epsilon squared because this x is already order epsilon, and the time derivative, which will be a slow time derivative, it derivative in this multiple scale analysis, that will also be order epsilon squared. And so that tells us that we should choose mu order epsilon squared. So let me call it epsilon squared times mu two. And um, similarly, the slow time, I call, take epsilon squared. Okay, so that means that, uh, of course, that the derivative with respect to the fast time becomes epsilon squared times the derivative with respect to the slow time of all quantities. Okay, now we can just start expanding and see what happens. Okay, let's go. Um, the lowest order term is like here's a y1, here's a y, here's an x. Well, it starts with order epsilon because the x is order epsilon, the y is order epsilon. So let's look at order epsilon. So what do we get? Um, 
Okay, so on the left side, we have x1, which is order epsilon, but we have a time derivative. And since all the time derivatives are actually slow, there's no fast time. We didn't, we just assume everything is in a slow time. There's no indication that there should be a fast time that we need. So that means this term is actually, when you look at it, it's actually epsilon cubed. Same thing with the mu x, it's also epsilon cubed because mu is order epsilon squared. This is epsilon, at least epsilon squared, and this is epsilon cubed. So we get actually for the x equation, we get simply zero equals zero. Okay. For the y equation, again, this is a order epsilon cubed, but this is order epsilon. And so we get zero is equal to minus y1, and the other terms are order epsilon squared. So the first conclusion we have is that y1 is equal to zero, and x1 is actually still undetermined. And that's of a characteristic feature uh, of this kind of uh, approach. That because we're, um, this is just a linear problem and um, the amplitude um, is arbitrary in a linear problem. And that's what this means. Okay, so we go to order epsilon squared. What do we get? As we said, the left term is actually order epsilon cubed. This is order epsilon cubed. This here is in principle, let me write it down. So on the left hand side we have zero, on the right hand side we have in principle x1, y1. But since y1 is zero, this is actually zero, right? So this is zero. And so we have again, nothing happening in the x equation. The y equation is zero equals minus y2 plus, and now here, we have an x squared, which amounts to x1 squared with order epsilon squared. So we get that term plus x1 squared. The y squared term is zero because y1 is zero. And so therefore we conclude y2 is equal to x1 squared, whereas x2 is undetermined. Okay. So let's, let's uh, revisit what do we actually want to achieve here? Well, we want to have an equation for the leading order terms, which in this case means essentially x1. So we still don't have an equation for x1 because x1 was undetermined at order epsilon and nothing showed up here at order epsilon squared. So we could get um, somewhat disconcerted about that because will we ever get an equation like for x1? Well, actually we will because, we, as we said before already, this pitchfork equation that we expect based on our center manifold analysis is actually, we said, each term is order epsilon cubed. So that should show up at next order. So let's do that. So we go to order epsilon cubed. What do we get there? Um, we get first a slow time derivative of x1. So we get d by d slow t of x1 is equal to, then we have mu x, which is mu is what epsilon squared x, for x is order epsilon. So this is actually mu two x1 plus xy. So that would be plus x1 y2 plus x2 y1 in principle. And um, then finally minus gamma x cubed, x1 cubed. While we're at it, let's write down the equation for y also. So we get a slow derivative of y1. And then we get minus equals minus y3 plus x squared, which is plus x squared, which would be 2x1 x2, and then minus y squared, which would be minus 2y1 y2. Okay, we can cancel a bunch of terms because we know that y1 is zero. So y1 being zero takes this term out, takes this term out. And um, we know y2, y2 is x1 squared. And so let's write down our equation for x1. We get d by dt 
of x1 is equal to mu2 x1 plus x1 times y1, my 2 is equal to x1 cubed, which is 1 x1 cubed, and then minus gamma x1 cubed. And that is the same equation we had before, just written in terms of the quantities x1 and mu2 instead of x and mu, because we factored out the epsilon. We also get an equation for y3, uh, which we can write down if we feel like it. Uh, actually, I won't because we're not so interested in that. Actually, maybe we should first think about what the equation for y2 even means, right? So we have two results. We have here the dynamics of x1. And here, this is the relationship between y2 and x1. Well, this is the equation for the central manifold, right? So we know that in our xy plane, we have the center eigenspace is the x-axis and the center manifold is tangential to that. And we see now that y as a function of x is given by y is equal to x squared. And as um, x evolves, right, x evolves here. Uh, as x evolves, actually the solution xy evolves on that center manifold and the dynamics is given by, are given by that equation here. Okay, so we've recovered the same result as in the center manifold reduction, which is good, uh, with a different approach, which is also good because we have now two tools to obtain essentially equivalent results. Later we will see there are subtle differences between the two approaches, and, uh, but right now we see they're essentially equivalent. Um, and the only thing that uh, we kind of could be unhappy with, so to speak, or unsatisfied is that to get the scaling here, we actually invoke the result from the center manifold reduction. Now, if we have to do that to proceed with this approach, then it's not very useful because once we have the center manifold reduction, once we've done it, we have the equation right here. So what's the point? So we'll see later how we guess actually these scalings efficiently by looking at the symmetries of the problem. But for now, let's just appreciate that we have used multiple scale analysis to derive this uh, equation.